This episode of The Christian Philosopher will see why Pascal's wager is the tenth reason to think that Christianity is true. Welcome back, everyone. Scott Sullivan here from the Aquinas School of Theology and Philosophy. I've been doing a series of videos called 10 Reasons to Think that Christianity is True. This is the 10th video, the 10th reason in this series. I mean, prior videos, we have seen that not only did Jesus claim to be God, and if he wasn't right about that, then he was either lying or crazy. Not only did he back up that claim by fulfilling prophecy, not only did he back up that claim by rising from the dead, not only did the religion that he preached spread rapidly, peacefully and improbably across uh, the ancient world, just like he predicted it would. Not only did he leave a miraculous picture of himself in the Shroud of Turin, as I have argued, not only does he still continue to work miracles in our day when we talked about the scientifically validated miracles, not only does the science of near-death experiences suggest that the human afterlife is precisely like what Jesus taught, what he said it would be like, uh, not only do we have credible evidence that demons are real like Jesus taught, and we have seen evidence that Mary, the Theotokos, the mother of God, has miraculously appeared to large groups of people. That's, that's nine reasons, right? Nine reasons so far uh, to think that Christianity is in fact true. And many of those by themselves can be enough to warrant Christian belief and and one could be intellectually uh, and prudently responsible in, 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 in believing in Christ based on just some of those reasons by themselves. But we got nine. Um, and what if you're sitting there, though, and this is still not enough for you? You're like, yeah, you know, that's, that's good. I'm glad you got those reasons, but I'm still kind of on the fence. I'm still not sure I buy it. What should you do then? Um, well, there's actually an option. That's where we get into this 10th argument. Now, this 10th argument is one that's a little bit different. We call it a practical argument. It comes from the mathematician and Christian thinker Blaise Pascal um, from 1623 to 1662. A very brilliant man who, who sort of is credited with the, 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 uh, being the founder of this argument. But a lot of people have kind of come up with it on their own. I mean, my grandmother came up with this on her own. She never read a, read a page of Pascal. Okay, so it's kind of a, a, a thing that Christians come up with on, on, our, on their own. And I'm trying to formalize it here. And certainly Pascal is credited with being the sort of the founder of this argument, at least in the formal, formal sense. And so how to kind of get your idea around this? Uh, you can think of how you live your life as kind of a gamble, right? How you live your life is kind of a bet. It's kind of a gamble. You are banking by the way that you live on a certain outcome or a certain worldview to be true, right? Let's say you want to choose a sinful and unbelieving path. You are banking on that atheistic worldview to be true. You want to live like God ex doesn't exist. You're, 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 you're banking on the idea that God doesn't exist, right? And conversely, uh, you want to choose a worshiping God path. I want to pray. I want to live my life according to the Ten Commandments. I want to go to church. Uh, you, you are banking on that worldview as turning out to be true as well. So you, you see what I'm saying? So how we live our life, as Pascal has pointed out, it's kind of like a bet. It's kind of like a gamble. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking this is going to be true, or I'm thinking that's going to be true. So uh, you got we have to decide prudently now, prudently, how are we going to live our lives? What, what is the, the best bet, uh, if you will? Let me give you an analogy to kind of get your mind uh, around this uh, initial idea here. Imagine for a second that you are stranded on a deserted island. All right, you're just stuck out there, a deserted island. Uh, do you think it might be a good idea to make, say, a signal fire, you know, send up a fire, send up some smoke in hopes of catching the attention of maybe a ship or a plane that might be passing by? You think that might be a good idea? Maybe it might be a good idea to take a stick and write in big letters in the sand, SOS, or help me, or something like that, just in case a plane might fly overhead and, and see that and, and, and you're rescued, right? Uh, this would be a reasonable and very prudent thing to do, even if you do not know if there are any planes or ships out there. It's just, hey, we should do this because, hey, if it's true, if, it, if there is a plane out there, we could be rescued this way, you see? Um, this would be a prudent thing to do. So when we talk about prudence here, 
um, it, it's a kind of a it, it's a kind of reason, but it's it's practical reason. Um, practical reason. It tells us how we should act. What is the wise course of action? That's how we use our practical reason. So let's make this distinction between what we call practical reason and let's call it evidential reason. So evidential reason would be something like reasons for thinking that something is true. That's the nine arguments I've been giving for Christianity so far. Okay, so evidential reason, reasons for thinking that something is true. Practical reason is different. It, it's a kind of reason, but it's a different kind of reason. These are reasons for thinking that, that we should do something because it's good. So evidential reason, reasons for thinking that something is true. Practical reason, reasons for doing something because it's good or beneficial for us in some way. These are two very different uses of our reason, but they both fall under that umbrella of, of reason itself. So when you understand what practical reason is, okay, this is how Pascal's argument works. This is how the Pascal's wager argument is going to work. This 10th reason for thinking that Christianity is true. It's a practical reason. Okay. We've been looking at nine evidential reasons so far. This is this 10th one is a practical reason known as Pascal's wager. You could call it Pascal's bet. Um, if you will. Um, the point here is that Pascal argues that belief in God is at least practically justified. Even if you're not even sure if it's true or not, it's practically justified. It, it's good for you. It's prudent to act as if God exists. Um, a lot of people don't like this argument. It's been criticized a lot. I go into great detail on this in this argument on this argument in my Aquinas School of Theology and Philosophy in my Christ 101 course. You guys can check that out. But the point of Pascal's wager argument is simply that, okay? It's that belief in God is the most reasonable choice on practical grounds. Okay, P Pascal says this. Let us examine this point and say, God is or he is not. But to which side shall we incline? Reason can decide nothing here. There is an infinite chaos which separated us. A game is being played at the extremity of this infinite distance where heads or tails will turn up. What will you wager? So Pascal is basically saying it's kind of like a coin toss in a way. How should you bet the coin is going to turn up? He says that belief in God is justified on practical grounds, even if the evidence doesn't tip you that way already. Why did he say this? Well, for the biggest reason, of course, is that after all, life has very few guarantees. We, we reason like this all the time. Should I take, should I quit my job and take this new job? Should I move across the country or not? Well, I'm not really sure. And we kind of go into this cost benefit analysis to find out what is the practical or prudent course of action. We do this all the time in our lives because again, life has very few guarantees. Should I buy this house or should I not? Our life is full of these kinds of decisions and we engage, we engage in this kind of practical reason all the time. So Pascal is suggesting that we do this here with the question of God and Christianity. Pascal's wager argues that when someone is faced with a forced decision, you got to decide one way or another, okay? The, the decision is forced under penalty of severe risk, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and then if the evidence is indecisive one way or another, if you have to make a decision, it's a big deal in how you decide it, and the evidence that you say is indecisive, Pascal's wager says that the wisest course of action is to choose the option, here's the key, that offers the greatest benefit for the least amount of risk. Let me say that again. The wisest course of action is to choose the option that offers the greatest benefit for the least amount of risk. So this is what we should do if we think that the evidence is inconclusive. If the evidential reasons can't determine the truth about God, then these practical reasons should kick in and decide the question for you. So this idea of the wager here is based on the idea that these practical considerations can sort of tip the scales 
uh, towards one action over the other if the intellectual reasons are inconclusive. Okay, so that's where we are. So, and, and what Pascal's point is, is that when we look at all the different religions in the world, he thinks it's conclusive. Christianity is the, is, has the best evidence by far. And we've been looking at nine reasons um, to think that. And Pascal, too, he will appeal to things like miracles and prophecies. And so it kind of narrows the options down, right? If our best religious option is Christianity, then the other thing is just a non-religious option, atheism, right? So we're going to believe we're gonna either going to believe in God, the Christian God, or we're just going to adopt uh, atheism. So assuming that you've done that and you're kind of at this intellectual stalemate, oh, I'm looking at the evidence, I can't really decide each one. You're not really sure which one's right this is where the wager kicks in so let's look at it this way either god exists or he does not and either you believe in him or you don't right either god exists or he doesn't either you believe or you don't when you combine those things you get four possibilities right you believe in god and he exists you believe in god and he doesn't exist you don't believe in God and he does not exist and you don't believe in God and he exists. So you get this sort of four possibilities and I've got this diagram here for you to look at kind of, this is how the wager argument works. Given the evidence, Christianity is the most plausibly true of all religions. You have to either choose to believe in this God or not. There is no other alternative. So you must choose and you choose with your life. You got to live your life one way or another. So you must choose Believe in God or not. If you believe in God, you take that path. It will turn out that you are either right or wrong about that. If you believe in your right, you will gain everything, enjoy everlasting happiness in heaven. But if you believe, and it turns out that you're wrong, hey, I, I believe in Christ and I'm wrong about that, you lose nothing. I mean, maybe you give up a few, few you know, pleasures of sin, but you also gain some things too, so that kind of cancels it out. But you really lose nothing by living for Christ and believing in Christ if you're wrong. You'll never even know you're wrong if atheism is true. You just die and you won't even realize, like, oh, shoot, I was wrong about that, because you just, you just go out of existence, right? So when you believe, the, the, the practical reason kicks in here, when you believe in Christ, you have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Let me say that again. Pascal's wager is arguing that if you choose to believe in Christ, you're either right or you're wrong, but either way, you've got everything to gain for that belief and nothing to lose. Pretty good deal. Pretty good option when you consider it practically speaking. But what about the other side? Let's, let's say you choose not to believe. Let's say you do not believe in Christ. Well, if you don't believe and you're right about that, you really gain nothing for that belief. Yeah, you might get some sinful pleasures in your life, but you know what? You also gave up a lot too, so that kind of cancels it out. Uh, if atheism is true, you'll never even know that you're right. You die, you just poof, go out of existence, and it's not like, yes, I was right after all. God doesn't exist, and there's no soul, because you just go out of existence. So you don't even get the satisfaction, typically, probably, of even knowing that you're right if you don't believe in God, and it turns out that you were correct. But let's say you don't believe, and it turns out that you're wrong. In that case, in that case, you lose everything. Let's be really blunt here. If you, if you choose not to believe in Christ, and it turns out that you're wrong about that, you will suffer, suffer eternal misery in hell forever. That's a lot to lose. You can't lose any more than that. So on the options of not believing, you're either right or you're wrong, you have everything to lose and nothing to gain. So if you believe, you've got everything to gain and nothing to lose. If you don't believe, you've got everything to lose and nothing to gain. This is a pretty big deal. And by the way, Pascal wants to insist that you have to choose. You, you, your ship has already embarked on the seas. You already exist. You're here in this life. How are you going to live it? You can't just say, well, I don't know. I'm going to be an agnostic. I'm not really sure. Well, not really sure, and then dying is the same way as not believing. So you have to pick one or the other. It's a forced option. You have to pick one. And if you're not sure of the evidence, I gave you nine arguments before, if you're not sure about that, then you're going to have to pick on practical considerations. Pascal says it's just the wise thing to do. So you can't keep from choosing. Um, so you must, what, choose wisely. 
choose wisely. So the point here, of course, is that atheism is the most foolish option one can take, right? Uh, who in their right mind would choose this path? Consider practically, right? Choose a path that offers nothing, but you risk everything. That's just, that's a terrible, stupid option. And, and Pascal thinks this, this wager type betting type reasoning um, points that out. So believing in God then is the wise choice. It is the wisest choice. Not believing in God is a foolish choice. Pascal thinks that then, therefore, that Christianity is the only safe course of action. We must choose to believe in God. And by this, choosing to believe in God or betting or wagering on God, it means acting on that belief. It means living as if God exists, at least. Okay, so um, that's the argument. I think it's solid. Now, there are a lot of objections, of course, to Pascal's wager. And again, I cover this argument in depth in my Christ 101 course, and you can check that out inside my Aquinas School of Theology and Philosophy, where I go into great detail in this argument. But I just want to address a couple of objections here. Uh, number one, some people accuse Pascal of endorsing a fake faith. Oh, he just wants me to fake it to save my own hide. Okay, I'll fake it. You know, I'll pretend like you exist, God, even though I'm not sure. Um, what kind of God is going to accept that? You know, what, what, what good is a fake faith? Um, is Pascal endorsing a fake faith? I say no. Actually, no. And he addresses this. What he's saying is, is that practical reason should get us going. It should sort of be the initial spark. It should start us to uh, get us to act like God exists, even if we don't have this real faith yet. But so we start praying, we stop sinning, we start going to church, we start asking God for help, we start developing what? A real relationship with God. And then Pascal says, when we do that, then we will have real faith. So this practical reasoning thing, it's just a kickstarter. It's just to get the ball rolling. Real faith will kick into gear later on down the road. Start acting like God exists. Start behaving in that way. Start praying. Start praying. Get the sin out of your life. When that happens, you'll suddenly you'll, it's like the, 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 the veil will be removed from your eyes. You will have real faith at that point if you can do those things. So these practical considerations are just a way to get the ball rolling, get people to stop sinning and praying and stuff like that. And when they do that, they will have real faith after that. So this objection uh, will not hold. Um, let's talk about another one. Because some people will say, well, yeah, I tried that. I tried this, and I still don't believe. All right, let me say a prayer. Oh, I still don't believe. Oh, it didn't work. You know what I mean? What about that? Or they try a little bit longer, right? What about that? Well, okay. Um, here we have to be very careful about the power of self-deception, right? When someone says they, they still can't believe, they tried all that, we have to remember that the human ability for self-deception and rationalization is very powerful. Pascal says... There is enough evidence for people who want to believe they can do so rationally, yet there's not so much evidence that's just going to force you and overpower you, okay? So there's enough evidence there. Don't give me that, okay? I gave you nine good reasons before. Check out the other videos in this series. If you get the sin out of your life, start praying, look at those reasons, make some friends at church, real faith will kick in. Don't give me that crap that you, you, you tried it and didn't work, okay? Um, God, Pascal says, has given us, given us enough evidence for open-minded seekers. See, the wager is an argument to get you to be open-minded, right? Open-minded seekers can believe these things without being irrational or weird. It's not pie in the sky, right? It's not tooth fairy reasoning, not Santa Claus. We have good reasons to think that Christianity is true, um, and the wager is, is to get us into a certain lifestyle to be open to those reasons. So, uh, in other words, assuming these Christian evidences have been sufficiently shown to people, there's no such thing as an honest skeptic. There's no such thing as an honest skeptic. And I'll, I'm going to do a whole another video on that topic as well uh, later on. The unbeliever in this case is just making up excuses. Okay, so uh, God does not give us an argument so much to overwhelm the skeptic. Hey, if you want to be a skeptic and keep raising that bar of evidence. God's going to let you do that. It's not going to force anybody uh, into believing, you know, through evidence. God doesn't want to force anybody. There's enough there to believe rationally, but you're not forced. Okay. 
So the power of these apologetic arguments uh, are sufficient to move any person that's not willfully resisting. Okay, that's the idea. Stop resisting, right, and you will believe. That's the point of Pascal's wager. All right, so let's summarize this argument here. Pascal's wager is a practical argument. It uses, it uses practical reason, reasons for thinking that something is good or a prudent thing to do. Um, and, and it dovetails quite well with these other nine lines of evidence that we've seen for Christianity. This, this practical argument for God argues that not believing in God is one of the most foolish things you can do because the unbeliever has everything to lose and nothing to gain. Why would you want to do that? So uh, Pascal's wager argues that it's just foolishness to not believe in God. It is foolishness to take a position that stands to give you little to no benefit but puts you at great risk of harm. In other words, Christianity is the only prudent course of action. So Given all the reasons that we've seen to think Christianity is true, we have now yet another reason, a practical reason, to think that Christianity is true.